<laughs> so here we are. Welcome to my podcast and my YouTube channel. Um, continue. This is my second interview for the Suicide Awareness Prevention Month. As I said before, I decided to collaborate with some of my colleagues, my fellow podcasters. So we have another one today, Christopher Parker Howard. He has actually a very, it's a very unique podcast. I love the name. It's called Coffee Over Suicide. And the way he calls it is great. He says it's a dramedy podcast about mental illness and choosing life over death, one cup of coffee at a time. Well, Chris, first of all, thank you so much for being here, but how on earth did you come up with this? <laughs> because you know how it is. Yeah. Suicide, right? It's a theme that nobody jokes about. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That was and honestly, that was sort of that was sort of where I was coming from. Um because I do take it very seriously. I I'm a suicide survivor. Um mm -hmm. I've I've lost people. Uh, yes. to suicide. And so it, it's, it's something that's very personal to me, mm -hmm. but I, I, I kind of came to this idea a after listening to podcasts for quite a long time and thinking nobody's doing one like this. Mm -hmm. And I found, I, I kept searching for different, different podcasts on mental health issues and things like that. And I wasn't finding one that was doing it the way I wanted to hear it. Mm -hmm. A lot of great stuff out there. Really yes. great stuff. Um, but I, I've, I've got maybe a, a, a bit of a, a, maybe a darker sense of humor. Uh -huh. Which <laughs> and is I think fine. that I've been through some things that in hindsight, yeah, th they're yeah. kind of funny. Um, you know, darkly funny for sure. But uh, I, I just decided... Well, if nobody's going to make this thing, I'll make this thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was that. And yes. it honestly okay. yeah. helped me quite a lot. <laughs> I'm sure because uh, humor, I, I honestly believe in the healing power of humor. Yes. And even though, I mean, my podcast is called Understand Suicide. It's a heavy topic. I, I get people like you who, were, who survived an attempt or someone who lost loved ones to suicide. But I always make sure to every interview to make someone laugh. Yeah. Because we just have to. We have to. It's very healing. And I actually interviewed, I don't know if you saw on my podcast, and I'll, I would be happy to get you two in touch it's a comedian and that's what he talks about he talks about he has chronic suicidal ideation and he makes fun of it and he does yeah. ted talks and he talks about it very openly and that's why he said well we have to laugh about these things because otherwise i mean i wouldn't be alive if i took it so seriously and i'm and i believe that so i get what you're saying yeah it, it's it, it's really powerful it's completely yeah. uh a, a way of sort of taking control over what can sometimes feel like an uncontrollable situation. Mm -hmm. So let's go there, Chris. What was it that was going on in your life that felt uncontrollable? I can, I can honestly tell you that uh, I first became aware of my suicidal ideation mm -hmm. uh, when I was very little. I, I remember my first thoughts were when I was about five and I was, I was up on the, the upstairs of the house that we lived in, in Michigan and I was coloring hmm. and my crayon fell over the railing and onto the floor below. Hmm. And I just remember thinking if I jumped down there, my, my head will break open like a clay pot mm -hmm. and I'll be done. And that kind of stuck with me forever. I would have wow. nightmares about it. I would literally have wow. nightmares about having a clay pot for a head. <laughs> wow. And, and, and I was old, a little kid. That's very young, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what was happening really at the time that made me feel that way, but I kind of, I kind of did feel like I wanted to sort of always be out of the way and, and quiet. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. which is a big juxtaposition from also wanting all of the attention in the world. So yeah. it was this strange dichotomy of mm -hmm. wanting no one to see me at all. But if they did see me, I wanted to be entertaining. And, mm -hmm. and that carried through um, into my teenage years. I, I started to really feel like something was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, I had a very troubled childhood as far as just self-esteem issues. And yeah. um, I was uh, I was what they called at the time a gifted child. Mm. But I also lacked focus. And so I couldn't go into the gifted programs because my math scores were just terrible. Isn't that uh, funny that they associate being gifted to math? Yeah. Yeah. So limited view. My goodness. It is. Uh, but I also thought that I was terrible at math for the rest of my mm -hmm. life until until I went to college and realized, oh, no, I was just I, I was just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put I'm actually good at math if <laughs> if I try. Um, but that was uh, that was my situation. I I I uh, I was I was about nine years old, fourth mm -hmm. grade when I first made an attempt hmm. um i uh, i i just i thought things were very difficult mm -hmm. really really hard mm -hmm. and i thought all of this i i need all of this sadness and all of this pain to just stop yeah yeah and so i i made i made a plan and i wrote a note and i put it in a return library book because I thought someone will see this eventually, uh -huh. but they won't see it right away. And so it'll, it'll make time. sense for my parents later. Mm -hmm. Wow. And uh, what I didn't know is that they check all of the books <laughs> when they come in yeah. immediately. Mm -hmm. So I was pulled out of school by a uh, police officer and sat down with the principal and my parents. And wow. it was very sad. And I started seeing a counselor and how old were you? Uh, nine years old. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I can imagine so young. Very, very young. Um, from that point forward, I was on various cocktails of antidepressants and things like that until I was about 13 when I got my diagnosis of bipolar one. Mm -hmm. Um, which and means, just, which, just for those who don't yeah. know what that means. So what that means is if there's a fun version of mental illness, uh, I got it. It's, it's the roller coaster version. It um, is. It because is. you get to go way, way up to the top and it's a great ride like up to the top. Unstoppable, right? I'm yes, unstoppable. exactly. Yeah. Let's go. This is going to be great. Mm -hmm. And then you plummet and it's equally as bad. Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. you're, de you're depressed, you're down, mm -hmm. you're, you feel physically weak. Yeah. Uh, it's difficult to get out of bed. It's difficult to move. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it can strike whenever at random. Mm -hmm. And typically it comes with, uh, having to take some mood stabilizers to get things, you know, back on, back on track along with maybe some antidepressants. Mm-hmm. And that's yeah. exactly what I did. I I had uh, several attempts in my teenage years. I feel like the cocktails of the medicine were not quite the right ones. Some of them made things a little worse. Yeah. And I was institutionalized um, twice. I, I I'm not sure if that's even the word that we use anymore. Uh, let's say I was let's say I was inpatient mm -hmm. twice. And it was the second time when I was about 16 that I realized that it wasn't the job of everyone around me to fix me. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the pills that were going to fix me. The pills were there to help me clear my head so I can fix myself. I got to do the work. I'm the one living with it. Mm -hmm. I'm the one that's got to figure it out. And that was kind of a tough thing to understand. 
but it also made things uh, a lot better once I realized that because once I realized I was in control Uh of my own destiny here as far as getting myself together and and Uh being kind of a whole human being, it, it really made my choices feel a lot more impactful. Hmm. Yeah. And that was kind of forever. I I decided in around 2004 uh after after my second child was born oh. that uh that changes things. That changed a lot yes. of things. Uh I decided that I wanted to uh, go off of the medication that I was on. Mm-hmm. So under the care of a doctor, mm-hmm. uh, my both my psychiatrist and my therapist, I took myself off of the medication slowly. Mm-hmm. And as it, as it has to be done. As it has to be done. And I monitored my behavior and yeah. my, my thoughts and all mm-hmm. of those things to make sure. And I just spent just about every waking hour figuring out coping mechanisms Mm -hmm. because I I had this thought if I'm ever stranded on a desert Island with no medication and Mm -hmm. no therapist is Mm -hmm. my own brain going to kill me? Wow. That's a good question to ask really, because that's how, what it feels like. Yeah, completely. Yeah. So I took myself off of the medication and I, the thing that I discovered was that the depression and the suicidal ideation and all of those things were still there. But just because they didn't go away didn't mean they weren't also manageable. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I came to sort of recognize when these thoughts would come into my head that I knew that it was it wasn't necessarily reality telling me mm-hmm. I don't belong here anymore or that uh, we should see what the front of this bus smells like. It was, it was, it was basically just some chemicals going off the wrong way. Mm-hmm. And I could acknowledge it and go, okay, let's get through this. That's yeah. well, it'll pass. It always passes. Yeah. Chris, let me go back a little bit because you said sure. something that uh, puzzled me because I've heard different versions of this, um, this, mo- this turning point when you say, you know what, this is about me. I have yeah. to do this. It's not about my, my parents institutionalizing me or putting me in the hospital. It's not about my therapist treating me and seeing me every week. It's not about medication. I have to take care of myself. But for some people, the realization that the mental illness is always going to be there can go the other way, right? The other direction. Do I have, so I'm going to live with this for the rest of my life and that can be daunting and overwhelming. So what do you think made you realize that, okay, and the turning point was a positive one. Okay, but I have to take care of myself because it could could have been the other way, right? And sometimes it is. That's when the attempt yeah. comes, right? So the, what do you think made a difference for you to go th- in that direction? Well, uh, the the first thing is is kind of scary. The first mm-hmm. thing. Uh, because my first thought was, I have nothing to lose for with trying to make a go of all of this because I have people that I love. I have things that I want to do. I have things that I enjoy, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to have this, I'm going to have this with me maybe for the rest of my life. And my first thought was, so work really hard right now and try to get a handle on it Mm -hmm. because if it doesn't work out, you can just kill yourself later. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, because that's what and, ideation does, right? Yeah. yeah, and that was my first thought was, well, if I can do it later, then why not mm-hmm. try to see if I can make things work now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it took me a while to get past that thought and into the thought of, no, 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 I can 
I can manage this. And and I did end up going back on medicine a couple of times, mm-hmm. um, on and off, at, kind of as needed, but always under the care of a doctor because uh, a friend of mine said, you know, if your brain is not making the right chemicals, store-bought is fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I liked that. I yeah. I thought that made a lot of sense. Uh-huh. I I love that you bring up the the right way of stopping medication because I don't want anyone who is listening to go, yeah, you know what? I'm going to do that too. And the yeah, way to no. do it, you have to see your doctor. I know I've been on medication too. And I remember mm-hmm. I, I went the other way because I was so scared of this <laughs> black hole that you go to yes. when you stop medication. Yeah. That my doctor said, you know, you just take one week, power, and then you do every other day for a week, and then you stop. I said, nah, I'm going to do every other week, <laughs> every other day for two weeks, and then maybe once or twice a week for two weeks. And that's what I did because I was so afraid of it. I really believed and I and I know because I see this in patients. I've seen I've seen what it does in family members. I mean, you go downhill really fast, and then yeah. to get those chemicals working again and leveled in your brain it takes forever. It does, and and I have uh, with being bipolar, I, I have some some pretty gnarly risks myself uh, mm-hmm. because mood swings. And it's not just mood swings. It's that that's the thing that's kind of tough to explain to people. Mm. Like when I feel a mania coming on, um, I know a couple of things about myself that mm. I've learned. So it's about and awareness, right? It's definitely about awareness. And I know once I start feeling that hyperactive way up high nothing can super touch me super productive yes like, just super getting things ten done interviews a day yeah yeah <laughs> uh i put the credit cards away <laughs> i don't make any big decisions uh if i have big decisions to make i write things down okay, but cool. That's i always great... tell myself don't make any big decisions yeah. you know in the middle of a mania Mm-hmm. Never, because when I was younger, even and I mean like I'm someone's dad, I'm a mm-hmm. I'm a parent mm-hmm. dealing with mania, you know, and it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm trying to take apart the washing machine to see how it works. Wow! Yeah. Like, just you know, you don't you don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because th- there is a misconception about mania, right? Because yeah. people think, wow, it must be great to feel that good all the time. No, because there are so no. so many consequences, right? Yeah, and you don't you don't always see it when you're in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty tough because it all makes sense at the time. It all makes sense. Mm. Uh, I, I remember particularly one time in the early days when I didn't quite have a handle on it. Mm-hmm. I remember that I had called my high school guidance counselor. Mm-hmm. at four in the morning mm-hmm. because I wanted him to get an assembly together at school because I thought I had solved racism. Wow. <laughs> and, and I was, I was like 25. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And you know, rightly so he, he asked me, are you all right? What's going on? Yeah. Let me ask you something about diagnosis because I'm, sure. I'm very curious on how being diagnosed with mental illness affects people. For some, it makes, it just gives you this answer that you are searching for. So, wow, now, now I make sense, right? My identity yeah. makes sense. And then you, it helps you because when you see those symptoms, you know, written down on the DSM or wherever you do your research, Google, <laughs> And you see, yeah, all of these ticks. And then you, again, it goes back to awareness and you go, wow, so what do I need to do now? I, I need to pay attention to these because this is where the mania shows up. And then what does the depression look like? And you see the symptoms. So I, I understand when people say, it, I made sense. I, I finally understood myself with diagnosis. For some, it's like a death sentence. Yeah. And they took away your identity from, from you because now I am this disease. And they really, I've seen, I've seen this in a lot of clients. They come to you, all they can talk about is their disease. They don't have a life. 
Yeah. You you ask them about their life and how they're doing, the kids, and they go back to, well, my medication is not is kind of off right now. I have an appointment next week. And then we go back and say, okay, let's talk about your family. Tell me about your son. Yeah, my son is doing okay unless I'm not feeling okay. And they go back to their disease. So how was it something that helped you understand yourself and deal with it, with your life? How, how did that land on you? You know, that's a, that's a really great question. Uh, I, I think that for me, it was sort of a road to, mm. from one to the other, because for me, my first reaction was kind of sort of a sunken feeling of, oh, this confirms that I'm broken and there's something wrong, mm. yeah. um, that I'm just wired wrong and I'm just going to stay wired wrong. But there there were definitely some changes that that helped a lot and one of the big things that helped the most was when i started seeing a therapist as well as a psychiatrist mm. cuz the psychiatrist that i saw he really was only interested in managing symptoms he didn't want to talk about anything it was no, just no. making sure medication. the medication it's about medication yeah which is fine yeah. uh if that's all you need mm -hmm. but i needed something else and the mm -hmm. thing that I needed to hear was you have a, 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 a diagnosis, a you a have condition. a condition, but you are not you a are condition. Not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are not your thoughts. You are not your feelings. You have your feelings. You have your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And those things were really, really important to me. It, it's it's kind of strange. The, the way that I would see things sort of portrayed out in the world too. Uh, it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of a weird time because uh, people were just starting to scratch the surface about talking about mental health and getting help for your, for your mental health publicly mm -hmm. in kind of an unshameful way in in the late 90s, mm -hmm. early 2000s, it really started to become more of a mainstream thing and mm -hmm. less the butt of the joke that it was maybe before. Um, and I think that that helped. My father was a substance abuse counselor. And so he had, he had some pretty good insight as well. I mean, he didn't talk much, mm -hmm. but when he spoke, it was, it was usually either funny or, or profound. Yeah. And so you listened. Yes. Right? So I listened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause he hardly ever said a word, but you know, once in a while he'd say, he'd say five words that just made all the sense in the world. Um, as a matter of fact, one time when I was very young, I shouldn't say very young, let's say I, I was, I was in my teen years. Um, mm -hmm. I was in a punk rock band. I was a drummer, uh, and having the time of my life, but also, uh, I didn't know that there were differences between the different kinds of drugs that were out there. And so I thought, you know, if you smoke pot or you drink beer and you don't die, then you must be one of those people who's immune to everything. And so wow. you can just do anything. Uh, I had a really bad night one night. Pretty sure I OD'd. And oh a God. friend's sister was a nurse. Uh -huh. And she kind of revived me and I remember her swearing at me and screaming at me mm -hmm. in her car as she drove me home um, and uh, threw me on my parents lawn I crawled into the house I got into bed my dad was a musician as well but he was completely sober mm -hmm. at this point in his life and so he got home from playing a gig four in the morning came in to check on me and I was unresponsive and, you know, weird. I, I don't know what I must have looked like, but mm -hmm. I do remember him freaking out. Mm. And I remember, you know, we, we definitely had a conversation about it <laughs> mm -hmm. over the course of the next couple of days where I tried to blow it off like I didn't do anything yeah, and I was just really tired and, yeah, you know, like, like kids do. Mm -hmm. And um, he came home from work. And he said, I thought you'd think this was interesting. And he gave me this card and it was a card of uh, all of the different street drugs you could imagine. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and what they do and how they work and mm-hmm. how lethal they are. Wow. And so after that, uh, I, I was like, oh, well, I don't want to I don't want to mess around with that. And I certainly don't want to start doing something that's going to have me addicted. So mm-hmm. I'm going to stay away from this stuff. Must have been so scary for your yeah. father. If that's I bet he, he was did. terrified. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But that was the smartest thing he could do was give me some education. Mm-hmm. Like an in, in education that required a, a certain level of trust. Because I may have been a little reckless, but I certainly wasn't a dumb kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I took a lot of chances that maybe I shouldn't have, but... Mm-hmm. I'm lucky that I never got really heavily wrapped up into mm-hmm. drugs and things like that. It kind of hit me all at once and then left me all at once. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about coping mechanisms. Yes. I know that this is something that you cover a lot on your podcast because you have many guests who come mm-hmm. and they've been through, you know, crisis in their lives and they all have their own way of coping with their situations. Tell me about yours. What are the coping mechanisms that you've learned? You said, okay, when I feel that the mania is coming and I'm getting hype, Mm -hmm. I put my credit cards away. But, and how about the depression? How do you deal with the depression, for example? Can you just take away for my listeners in case they're going through the same thing? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's so important. Um, Coping mechanisms are everything. Mm-hmm. Because even if you're even if you're on medicine and it's the right medicine and it's working, it, it doesn't always take away all of your symptoms or, you know, all, all of your proclivities as a person. Sometimes you've still got to step in and and manage some things, um, and, and coping mechanisms are really just about the best thing you can have in your back pocket for any given situation. Uh, for me, especially with depression and things like that, it's always been kind of a matter of taking a moment to ask myself uh, what the validity of my situation is. Mm-hmm. If it's really high or really low, I check in and I step back and I say, how like how valid is this feeling? Mm-hmm. Where is this coming from? Yeah. Uh, and I try to take a step back and really think through it, um, almost in a almost in a cognitive behavioral therapy sort of way, mm-hmm. like where you um, where kind does of address it come from, right? Yeah, where does it come from? Is it true? Um, how likely is it that it's true? And if it's true, then what? Mm-hmm. Um, and really just being able to take a step back and analyze things is, is pretty important. That's step number one, but sometimes taking a step back and analyzing can still put you in a spiral where, Mm. uh, you think to yourself, of course it's true. Uh, the, uh, all of my evidence proves that this is true. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it isn't, that's how I feel (laughs) it. Precisely. True. That's right. exactly what I mean. That is mm-hmm. that is how it feels. It feels true. It feels mm-hmm. like it's never going to end. It doesn't it doesn't matter whether or not it is true, but it it, it for how it feels. Mm-hmm. I mean, it definitely matters. Yeah. But the the only thing that you can really do in a case like that when you're when you're so down is it really helps to tell yourself, I can do this. Mm-hmm. I can I can get past this. I can wait. And it's going to pass. I'm just going to wait this out. So usually, I think the best thing you can do is continue on with whatever your plans are. As far as going to work, mm-hmm. going to meet friends, Go to the movies, go bowling, go dancing. In fact, anything you can do that gets your body moving physically oh, yes. is it's gonna huge. be very huge. helpful. It and may not take everything it's away. It's something nobody we usually don't think about, right? But exercise, yeah. my goodness, it's so helpful. Especially when you walk. feel like your body is heavy and, and it 
it doesn't want to move and it can't mm-hmm. move, that's usually a good sign that you're going to feel better if you do. Yeah. That's that's kind of a big one. Um, mm-hmm. Growing up, I was never really into athletics or sports or mm-hmm. anything like that. But I discovered some things that work for me. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for a long time, I was into skateboarding. That was nice. Playing the drums. That was nice. Yeah. Um, getting up and moving around. I have a dog. I love to take the dog for a walk. walk. <laughs> now, especially if you're a depressed person and you've got a dog, that's really, really helpful in a lot of cases, especially yeah. if you take your dog for a walk. Because the dog is going to show you the world. Yeah. The dog is always excited. To, <laughs> like look at the this first look walk at this in leaf. their lives, right? Look at the sky. What is that smell? It's garbage day in my neighborhood today. Dog, that is my dog's favorite day because there are smells <laughs> everywhere. And you know what? It also puts you in touch with people because everybody comments yeah. on the dog. Some will come and pet it. And uh, it just helps in every possible way. Yeah. gets you moving, but it gets you connecting with people. The other thing I would say that's very, very helpful in a lot of cases is writing it down. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're feeling in those moments, write it down. Yeah. Write it down. Have, it, have a pad and paper somewhere in your house at all times. Mm-hmm. And write these things down as they come. Sometimes you can turn that into something, and sometimes you can just look back on it when it passes and remember this is what that felt like Mm -hmm. and to be able to look at that and say i lived through this i will live through this again and i will i will live through this again that's exactly right yeah great chris let's talk about the dramedy podcast (laughs) yes it's called coffee over suicide i highly recommend it just go right now wherever you listen to your podcast then subscribe to it or favorite whatever it asks you to do so it's always there for you he records weekly is that it yes that's right okay tell us about your podcast what is it about what kind of people do you interview is that you talking only sometimes it is it is uh my favorite thing that Uh i've ever done i get Uh, it (laughs) it's uh so it's a dramedy podcast because it can kind of go both ways sometimes in the same episode. Um, you know, you, you've kind of seen my energy here. It's, Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's for the most part pretty up even when I'm talking about, you know, trying to thinking about suicide as a five-year-old it's because there's something a little ridiculous about it. Um, and it's, and sometimes it does get a little dark and we're not afraid to cry. And there's definitely been some some episodes that that went pretty heavy, mm-hmm. and there were tears. Yeah, and that's part of it. That's and that's fine. part of it. But that's sometimes, life. sometimes there's jokes, and it's funny, <laughs> and we have a good time talking about our mental health experiences. And that's who I have on the show. I have on uh, usually musicians and comedians and. Uh, business owners and uh, people from everyday life, anyone who is willing to share their story of the struggles that they're going through and how they're dealing with it, Mm -hmm. because that's really the key. What are you doing? How do you deal with it? What gets Mm -hmm. you through the day? Because Mm -hmm. the things that I've learned and the things that I know, I didn't get those from myself. I got those from other places. Mm-hmm. And just because I've done things a certain way for as long as I've done them doesn't mean that there's not another way to do it. And mm-hmm. so I've learned a lot from talking yes. to people about their yes. situations. Yes. And that's what it is. It's just two people having a conversation. We start talking about something. And then at some point, it always goes into what's your mental health like and mm-hmm. how did you get there? Mm-hmm. And what do you do when you feel like this? Yeah. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's yeah. I absolutely love it. I was listening to one of them and you talked about something that is to me it's so profound and so meaningful because you start talking about okay it it's about 
getting through the day. It's about getting up and doing your thing and believing that you can get go through it and enduring it. And then you yeah. you kind of correct yourself and you so. But is enduring the only option? Because it's yeah. not, is it? It's not about endurance. I mean, what kind of a life is just endurance, right? Yeah. So I actually had someone come uh, to my podcast and she talks about values, which I think are very, very important. And she said, yeah, it's not about when you talk to someone who is suicidal. It's not just about being alive. That's not the point. It's about yeah. building a meaningful life, something that makes sense to you. So it's the same thing that you talked about. It's not just about enduring, right? right. It's about having some joy, right? Having people in your life, knowing what, what you enjoy. So t tell us a little bit about that. It's not about enduring, right? Right, right. That is so true. That's, it's wonderful when you can, even sometimes in the moment, figure out, that you've been wrong about something and mm -hmm. pivot yeah. and go the other way. And that was one of those moments. And that has actually changed my modus operandi mm -hmm. <laughs> moving forward. Yeah. I definitely try to focus on the things that bring me joy, the things that make me happy and the things that make me who I am. Mm -hmm. And there are ways that, a brain that is wired for these kinds of things uh, can be useful. Mm -hmm. And it's a matter of finding the way to make use of the unique perspective that you've got mm -hmm. and recognizing it as a possible strength versus uh, a debilitating weakness. And also the duality of that, that sometimes it's a debilitating weakness but sometimes is the key word, sometimes, mm -hmm. because it, it passes, it changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that for me, the idea of putting yourself forward with uh, as much honesty and energy as you've got is really the most rewarding way to live your life. And once you strip away some of that fear of how you're going to look, how you're going to be perceived, mm -hmm. it, it, it really does start to feel like a superpower mm -hmm. yeah. being able to talk to anyone about anything. Yeah. And that's what I love about your podcast is that, it's about what you can do. It's about your responsibility over your life and yeah. your ability to change. Yes. And that's what all these stories come to you and they say, okay, here's where I was, here's where I am, and I may go back there again, Yeah. That, but that's okay. But at least now I know how to handle this better. And I love your work, Chris. So again, Coffee Over Suicide, that's the podcast. Thank you for being here with me during the Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. I'll still have one more coming. It will be Suicide Awareness Australia. That, that will be my next one, and that's when I'll finish my series. Thank you for saying yes and for being here with us and sharing. Okay? It was my pleasure. I love the show. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm.